Good afternoon. Is it on? Oh, yes, it is. Hi, everybody. Now comes dessert. You can eat the dessert at your table, but you can also listen to Lamberto Zanier for dessert. And you can do both. Uh, I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center, uh, a card-carrying partner of the OSCE, uh, certainly for today and tomorrow, but hopefully for much longer than that. Uh, we are, as I think all of you heard who attended the morning sessions, uh, partnering uh, with the OSCE on the first ever security day outside of Vienna, Austria. The security day initiative uh, was started by Secretary General Zanier uh, a few years back, and those days which deal with um, important issues uh, challenging the mission of the OSCE have been held in Vienna for some time. I participated in one last May following uh, a trip to Ukraine uh, to observe the presidential election as part of a uh, U.S. delegation led by Madeleine Albright. And I saw what the OSCE can do, assembling all kinds of folks who are part of its membership, but other people too, uh, to discuss uh, the critical issues. And uh, Lamberto and I talked about bringing, putting the sh taking the show on the road and bringing it to Washington and where it is today and then tomorrow going on to uh, Chicago. And all of this fits pretty well because today, as, as many of you who attended this morning saw, we addressed uh, two critical issues uh, challenging uh, the U.S. Uh, Euro uh, uh, community and actually the Eurasian community. And those were uh, Ukraine. Uh, I, I would say that panel was riveting and Afghanistan, and this afternoon we move on to terrorism and then the future. And once at five o'clock comes around and we close this down, we will have settled the difficult problems. But at any rate, here we are. The attendance is amazing. Um, by last count, we have 28 ambassadors in attendance, either now or uh, during much of the morning, and a few showed up last night. We appreciate it. Uh, the OSCE has... Uh, 57 members, and 45 of those members are represented here, either by ambassadors or others, uh, and I would call that a pretty impressive start. So this is a conversation uh, with uh, Secretary General Zanier. We intend to keep it informal. It's short. It's 30 minutes, 15 minutes of uh, conversation between us, and then 15 minutes of your brilliant questions. So if you have brilliant questions, formulate them now because they need to be offered in, simple, in a simple declarative sentence so we can get around to people. Um, and let me just see if there's anything else, I, any other brilliant insights I want to mention. Yes, one of them is uh, that um, uh, the Wilson Center, as most of you know, has, uh, is known for its uh, visiting scholars. We have 150 uh, world-class scholars in residence at one time. Many of them are sitting in this room, and uh, you will actually um, uh, meet some of them later. Uh, but one of those scholars last May, uh, newly arrived, was a fellow named Wolfgang Issinger. And he, uh, many of you will know, got enormously high marks when he was German ambassador to the US. Uh, he was also German ambassador to the UK. And when he retired from the Foreign Service, he became, and still is, uh, the chairman of the Munich Security Conference, voted the number one rated uh, uh, security conference in the world. It's, it's a fabulous place. But anyway, uh, Wolfgang agreed to come to the Wilson Center as a distinguished diplomat in residence. He arrived. Uh, we held the fancy dinner. Three days later, I got an email. Oops, sorry, got to go to Kiev. Uh, I've been uh, asked to chair uh, this, this series of roundtables that the OSCE was putting on uh, just before the presidential election to try to generate uh, uh, participation everywhere in the country by all different uh, groups in the country. And of course, Wolfgang did that, that, that uh, mission brilliantly. I was furious. And Lamberto, I've been waiting to tell you how angry I am at you. All right, on that, on that note, let's start off having a fight. Um, 
this morning, you introduced the session and you said geopolitics is back uh, and the lack of strategic reconciliation in Ukraine is enormously destabilizing, not just in Ukraine, uh, but also in Europe and obviously given the fact that one of the participants is Russia in the world. Um, could you elaborate on that? What, what did you mean by geopolitics is back? Well, we, we are, and, and sometimes when I look at the, at the issue of Ukraine and the way it plays on the agenda of the organization, um, uh, I have to say I can't avoid thinking back of the time when, uh, uh, when the OSC was the CSC. And, uh, and we still had uh, uh, groups of states and the, and the interaction between the, those groups of states, NATO, the Warsaw Pact, and the neutral and non-aligned, uh, was, was a, an extremely complicated one. Um, uh, one, one of the uh, uh, still uh, thoughts I have from, the, from that period was, well, first of all, the tone of the, the, tone of the discussion, which I found again back in the Hofburg now, um, uh, secondly, also the fact that uh, progress on, uh, on the agenda of the organization becomes very difficult. And, uh, and, and the CSE, now we look back at the CSE as a success because it contributed in many ways to overcoming those divisions and, uh, and the reunification of Germany and all that. But it was a complicated and, uh, and uh, uh, drawn out process that went on for, uh, you know, s s from 75 to 90, it was 15 years. And, uh, and for many uh, of those years, the progress was, was very limited. Uh, now we, we find ourselves um, uh, in, in the organization, we find again a, a kind of atmospherics and the kind of issues uh, that are, again, very divisive. There's a very strong polarization in, in the organization. Um, decision making is becoming very difficult for the ministerials, even though we had very able chairmanships who managed, uh, uh, in spite of the atmospherics, to, uh, uh, um, uh, to make important decisions and to advance the agenda of the organization. Uh, actually, one of the things we see is that one part of the agenda of the organization is uh, very much focused on uh, 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 geopolitical considerations, if you want. Other parts of the agenda of the organization, we'll see, we'll see this afternoon. If we talk about uh, issues of, like foreign fighters or terrorism, the global security challenges, then there is a different kind of alignment and, uh, and there is a, a, a positive convergence, if you want, of all players. So we managed to make progress on those, on those uh, broader issues. Whereas, whereas on, the, on, on the regional uh, uh, questions, we still find these blockages. Um, in a way, Ukraine, and that's another consideration, has uh, um, um, put uh, uh, under the spotlight uh, in, a, in a more uh, having a more dramatic way uh, a, an issue that we have we have seen uh, uh, that we have seen developing o over time. And this, this, some of these you heard in the, morning, in, in the debate this morning, the perception of Russia uh, versus the expansion of uh, Euro-Atlantic institutions and all that. But also, and this was, came out a bit less clearly this morning, a, a, a certain difficulty that uh, uh, Russia has in living in its own uh, post-Cold uh, War uh, space, in a way. Uh, in this, broad, in this broad context, and uh, obviously the two things can be you know, uh, in interrelated in, in various ways. Uh, but as we deal with Transnistria, and uh, these days there is a strong focus. I was in, in Georgia last week, and there is a treaty uh, which is uh, going to be signed now between Russia and South Ossetia, and the one uh, was, uh, was signed recently with Abkhazia. And, and some of the, uh, the processes that uh, do affect these regions, uh, uh, if one looks at the, at the root causes of these, uh, of these conflicts, of these protracted situations, uh, one finds also common elements with uh, uh, some of the things that we, we have seen in, in Ukraine. So the, 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 the narrative, in fact, uh, uh, there coincides in, in, some, in some of, the, in some of, uh, of these things. I didn't mean to cut you off, but that, sure. that in a way, even though these problems are hard, may be a good news story, given the fact that the OSCE includes all the protagonists. It's a consensus organization. You've worked on problems over many years. And as you were saying at lunch, 
Uh, even things like the, the monitoring groups uh, that are trying to have more access in Ukraine include, in a few instances, Russians. Uh, that has to kind of stir the pot in a very interesting way and possibly lead to uh, ways to work out problems. Yeah, in, in spite of the internal divisions, uh, the OSC remains the organization that brings everybody around the table. And uh, in, in Europe, it's, it's the only, uh, in a way, inclusive organization. And it's inclusive also in, in uh, political or even geopolitical terms. It has a transatlantic dimension because it includes the, the US and Canada. Uh, so, so there, it, in, in a way, uh, 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 coincides with the, the NATO uh, sort of uh, um, uh, coverage, you know, geographical coverage and geopolitical coverage. And then it includes the Eurasian uh, angle, right. and, uh, which is also very, uh, very, you know, very fitting in a way, uh, uh, given also uh, the, 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 the way the, the uh, Eurasian integration is, is developing. And now there, there seems to be strategically a collision between these two spaces. But the USC is the organization that encompasses all of it. And, and, uh, uh, and then it becomes automatically the organization where you have a chance for engagement. Uh, and uh, and uh, so to the extent that there is a possibility uh, to make progress based on, uh, um, on dialogue, even, even in this highly polarized environment, uh, the OSC is what can provide that. There is a debate on the OSC on whether we should uh, strengthen enforcement, uh, including uh, through re-looking re at the decision-making process and uh, developing, for instance, models of decision-making based on uh, consensus minus one. Uh, so that you can pin down uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the guilty party in a way if everybody else agrees that there is a guilty party. Uh, but that would undermine this notion of inclusiveness, of course, and this is, this is what the debate, uh, uh, the debate is about. And, and it is important, uh, uh, I think, to say today that we uh, are running an operation in Ukraine which is agreed by everybody, the Ukrainians first of all, uh, but then, uh, in spite of the uh, very visible differences, but everybody else, uh, uh, the Russians, uh, the Americans, the Europeans, uh, Turks, and everybody else. Well, it's, I, I think it's fascinating, and of course I can't uh, uh, resist a little shameless self-promotion. The Wilson Center provides some of those functions, too. We're not a membership organization, but we provide a platform for in-depth civil nonpartisan discussion of some of the toughest issues and people like the people who came this morning, ambassadors of countries that disagree with each other and have a very different interpretation of facts, come here to talk civilly. And members of Congress who disagree and don't even talk to each other a mile from here, come here and address issues. Speaking of which, that's my second question. Uh, if you were invited to the United States Congress right now, um, which is very productively working and probably won't have time to engage you this minute. And you were asked to explain the OSCE to a, a few members of Congress, just the right ones. Let's imagine who they are. I won't name them. Um, what would you say, you have just a few minutes to explain why the OSCE should matter to the United States Congress. What would you say? Well, I would say that we have uh, various tools in the international community. Uh, we have uh, tools uh, uh, that are alliances and, uh, and they have a more military uh, uh, component. There are others who have a stronger economic. Uh, and, and there are tools that are there just to promote security in a cooperative manner. Uh, and of course, these tools can be used in different ways in different times. Uh, but they can also be used simultaneously, but in different ways in, in relation to specific situations. The OSC is a tool for engagement, and so to the extent that we find the space uh, to, to engage and to try to solve issues in a, in a way that is uh, uh, peaceful and, and based on consultations, the, the, the OSC is there to, to, to help. It can be effective. Uh, we have shown that once uh, we uh, agreed on uh, having an operation we mounted in a matter of, uh, of days. And we, we had monitors on the ground on a, on a weekend when the decision was taken on a Friday night on a day there was an OSCE holiday. And we, we, <laughs> we, we worked on the, on the Friday night and on the Saturday we were the first people appearing in Kiev. 
And it took us longer to have privileges and immunities from, from Ukraine than in having the first 150 people in, 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 on the ground. And I even took a degree of risk myself in sending people in without this because the RADA had not, had not ratified. Uh, so the organization is efficient, but, uh, but uh, you know, putting together and, no, no, and uh, lining up the ducks sometimes is more complicated. So I've just had an epiphany. Maybe we should outsource my former employer to the OSCE. Uh, <laughs> and see how that goes. My final question right. is about tools. You, you mentioned tools. You have uh, monitors on the ground. You have done these roundtables. There is obviously an issue about the access of, and safety of your monitors on the ground. I'm talking about Ukraine. Uh, a, a controversial issue is whether to provide, and we're not going to debate it here, uh, the Ukrainians, as they have requested, with defensive uh, military tools. Uh, one tool that isn't a defensive military tool, but that might be a tool the OSCE could use is, is overhead imagery. We were just talking about that. And let's call it overhead commercial imagery so we don't get into the argument about uh, disclosing possibly the capability of some uh, classified uh, technology. Uh, what is the status of your efforts to have access to overhead uh, commercial imagery, and what are the obstacles? This is an interesting development because it follows uh, uh, Minsk II. And in Minsk II, there was a call for the OSC to rely more on, uh, on technology in carrying out its tasks. Um, in a previous phase, we tried to go there, to, to look at satellite imagery, but we found skepticism, we found questions, and, uh, and uh, some delegations, more than others, were telling us you need a specific mandate for that. I feel that with Minsk, we don't now need anything else. We have, we have a mandate to do that. And since we still experience difficulty uh, uh, of uh, the physical access of our monitors to certain areas, uh, we do feel that we can compensate for that by using, uh, by using uh, imagery. And, and we're looking now into satellite, including commercial satellite. The European Union is helping us already. They're providing us already uh, with, uh, uh, with the imagery uh, that is supporting us in also guiding uh, our monitors to areas where, based on, this, on the images, we see we need to look a bit better to understand what's going on. Uh, we have drones, and we want to develop that, UAVs, we, we call them more, more appropriately. Uh, we, we are looking into other uh, technical solutions, including cameras, fixed cameras, cameras on uh, aerostatic balloons. Uh, we need to make sure nobody shoots at them, of course, so that is part of the, uh, of the discussions that, uh, that we're having, and we need to have uh, assurances from, uh, from everybody. Uh, ideally, I, I would like to have, uh, and this is why we're looking into, into commercial imagery also, uh, to have the possibility of uh, uh, somehow attaching images to the reports of our monitors so that you know, can, they can be circulated and they can give a sense also of what we see and, and where we see problems. And so that, that should be, uh, um, I think, as a matter of fact, a matter of course, uh, a, a procedure that we should be able to develop in the OSC. Well, it seems to me your value added, and folks, we're turning to you right now, uh, is that you can provide ground truth and a hopefully agreed set of facts, agreed by your 57 members, not promising that that will hap happen, but you have a, a good shot at doing that. And if people can agree on the facts, maybe they can then begin to have the kind of conversation necessary to agree on the political solution. I think we all agree that, that ultimately the, the solution in Ukraine has to be political. And, and just one final comment. It's not all about instability and fighting. It's also about the reforms that the people who risked their lives on the Maidan were demanding. Um, anyone who's been there, uh, and I think many of you have been there, uh, gets that. And so there is a lot for uh, uh, the Poroshenko uh, regime to get done in addition to uh, asking for help and getting help from the OSCE and others uh, with respect to hopefully ending violence. Uh, questions? Right here. Oh, wait, microphone is coming quickly. Quickly. Here it comes. State your name, please. Stand up and ask a simple question. Hi, John Hudson. John Hudson with Foreign Policy Magazine. 
Uh, Mr. Secretary, you mentioned uh, photographs being added to reports, and I, I think everyone would agree that could have a profound impact given the power of uh, imagery. Uh, what has to happen within the OSC internally to get to the point where some of those reports do include images? Well, um, my, my, my uh, feeling is that we will need to go in the direction of having a, a, a provider of imagery that is as neutral as possible in a way. So we would, uh, I, my preference would go for a commercial solution of some kind. And, and we, we are starting looking into, into that. The problem with this is, of course, the costs. And the costs, one, one of the downsides of the OSC, and I think somebody mentioned it this morning, is the budget. We, uh, and sometimes I, and, uh, and I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, Jenny, you, you keep hearing this, but I, I'm coming from uh, heading, leading a peacekeeping operation of the UN in Kosovo. When I moved and I got the job in the OSC, I moved to the OSC, an organization that has a secretariat, a conference services, three institutions, uh, ODI, the High Commission of Freedom of the Media, uh, 16 or 17 field operations now, some of them really big, 600 people in Kosovo, uh, 400 in Bosnia, and, uh, and of course uh, uh, now we have this, this large. So the budget of the OSC was smaller than the budget of the whole of the OSC, was smaller than the budget I had in Kosovo for a single UN peacekeeping operation. So, uh, finding money for the OSC is a struggle. Plus now the notion of zero nominal growth, we can't even grow. So what we did, we effectively ran a peacekeeping or a quasi peacekeeping operation, SMM, for six months based on extra budgetary funds. So we had uh, the, the Swiss chairmanship had to call donors meetings asking everybody, give us money so that we can send monitors to Ukraine. And, uh, and, and then we had to start telling people, give us money so we can buy or, or, or in fact, lease a couple of drones or UAVs to, uh, to monitor things. Now, with the extension, we finally managed to have the, the decision that the mission has been extended for a year. We finally managed to have uh, a good uh, part, uh, over 70%, of uh, um, assessed contributions. So there is a more stable basis for the further life of the organization. But this covers uh, the current function. So everything on top of that, we will have to discuss. And we probably we will have to fundraising, fundraise again. And if it's expensive, it's going to be a bit of a, uh, of a problem. Sounds like how Congress runs the federal budget. Right. <laughs> uh, back there, yes. Stand up, yes. Mr. Secretary General, Mari Salino from Northrop Grumman. One issue that combines both humanitarian questions and uh, security for Europe is the hugely increased flood of immigrants across the Mediterranean. And I wonder whether the OSCE is looking at this or is it simply something that the EU is dealing with? And no, your, con yeah. your country in particular. Sure, uh, sure. <laughs> Actually, we, we are in the midst of, this, of, a, of a discussion on, on migration uh, because we deal with migration from many angles. For instance, we have a special representative that deals with trafficking human beings, which is an important issue. It's, it's high on the agenda of the organization, and we deal with this in many, in, 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 from many angles, many areas. Uh, the economic coordinator deals with it. Uh, as we deal with terrorism, we, we look at relations between uh, migration and terrorism. But then the whole agenda of uh, the director of ODIR, who uh, will be somewhere around the room, uh, but, uh, but the, 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 so the, the, human, the human rights component uh, uh, of this. Um, uh, and uh, more and more now the intercultural, interreligious issues and, and the impact that also migrations have on these things. So now we, we are looking at, uh, uh, at this uh, complex set of issues all revolving around migration and we, we start looking into developing a, a policy uh, that uh, uh, for, for the OSC focused on the, on the issue of migration itself. And this is something where, uh, an area where we engage also with our partners, including, uh, first of all, the, the Mediterranean partners, who are interested in this area. Uh, so we will see, in fact, uh, as I say, the issue now is gaining a, a stronger profile. Uh, there isn't uh, a decision on uh, how to handle it, even though there are statements already that show interest of, uh, of participating states in the, in the OSC for this, uh, for this uh, 
issue. Uh, my feeling is that, the, and this is actually a question more for the Serbian chairmanship, but my feeling is that the Serbian, the Serbian chairmanship would be interested in focusing further on this issue and perhaps seeing by the time of the ministerial meeting in Belgrade if we have enough uh, to set in motion a more active policy of the OSCE in dealing with, with migration. We will have to see also what the various stakeholders think, in, in particular the European Union, uh, what role the European Union sees for the OSCE in this area, an area where the European Union has rather stringent and, and focused, and, but also internally uh, uh, not uh, uncontroversial uh, policies. Great answer. How about over here? Questions? You know everything you need to know? Other questions? Really? No questions? Well, let me ask, I'm looking right at him. Uh, as you know, there are uh, successive chairman over year periods of the OSCE, and the Serbia, the, uh, Serbia is now in the chairmanship, and the very impressive representative of Serbia is looking at me. He's about five feet away from me. Uh, maybe you could take a minute, because this is not exactly the same audience that we had in the morning, and just talk about what some of your priorities are uh, for the year of your chairmanship. And I'll hand you my microphone. Oh, it's on. Oh. Okay. May I use Surprise. it? Sure. Thank you very much. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, Lamberto started talking about one of the issues which are of uh, significant importance to uh, our chairmanship. Uh, migration, as he said, we uh, dealt with last year uh, chairing the Mediterranean contact group, but we also started talking about a regional initiative, to develop a regional initiative regarding the illegal migrations. As you know, our area, our region of Southeast Europe, Balkans, former Yugoslavia, call it as you wish, is a very popular area for those who want illegally to migrate through Asia, from Asia or, or North Africa through uh, European Union. So we do have some mechanisms and some forms of cooperation uh, developed already, but we felt that uh, OSC, within the OSC framework, we can also develop new initiative and new mechanisms. We will see whether uh, during this year, we will be able to finalize something. It's, it's, all these processes are long, and as Lamberto mentioned, the uh, EU is very strong and uh, on this have strong positions, so we also have to talk to them. But this is one of the areas which may be of interest uh, as, as a specific issue of our priority. Well, it's, migration is a, is a big focus of the Wilson Center, so ne maybe we'll have another security day uh, sometime in the future after we've resolved the Ukraine problem on migration. Uh, Lamberto, you wanted to say something? Oh, we have a question. Yes. Ha. I apologize. It's not a question, but just a comment or an addition to what has just been said. Just to say, <clears throat> Germany has this year the honor and pleasure to chair the Mediterranean Contact Group. And indeed, the issue of migration and the related subjects of refugees, uh, human trafficking, is one of the key issues on our agenda. And uh, this year, we'll have it as uh, a subject for our contact group meetings, which take place in Vienna. Uh, but at the same time, we are planning to have this uh, yearly key event, namely the Mediterranean Conference, uh, in a partner country, that is to say a country of the a Mediterranean region, and I believe that this issue will also then be a, a focal point, whereas more generally we are of course looking broadly, and that is a leitmotif, so to speak, of our uh, uh, agenda this year at the issues of uh, countering radicalization and fighting terrorism. Thank you. Which we will address in the next uh, panel following this lunch. Other questions? Observations? Jill Doherty, Wilson Scholar. 
Wait, wait, wait. You can be unrepentant, but you're still a Wilson scholar. <laughs> All right. Yes, Jill Doherty, trying to live up to be to being a Wilson scholar. Um, you know, I have a question that really g gets into a little broader area, but it's been on my mind, which is values. You know, some of this came up this morning, but when you think of European Western values, there's been a concept that was pretty acceptable since certainly the 1970s and, and before that. And now there's kind of a counter narrative of values, which says traditional values um, would be the catchphrase, but it, it essentially is more conservative. Sometimes it deals with women's issue, the women, women's issues, the role of women, a more traditional role. When in your work at the OSCE, is this debate, which is really raging in a lot of the areas that we're talking about, is that having an effect? Is it uh, complicating the way you uh, make decisions or discuss issues? Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think I can say that this is complicating the decision making, but it shows uh, the depth of the rift in the, in the organization. Uh, so the, it is not only uh, geopolitics in a way, and it's not only about uh, lines on the map, but it's also, uh, uh, it's much broader than that. It's also about, uh, you know, our, uh, the, the way in which we live. And, and the way uh, and what are the, the key uh, uh, the key uh, values, if you want, or principles in, in, in life. And uh, uh, what is interesting is that we are trying to launch a debate on the basics. On uh, let's go, let's go back and relook and reconfirm because that's that's the idea. Uh, you know, the key principles and the key values on this, on, this uh, on which the organization is founded. And uh, at that level, we find everybody saying, but there's no question, we all agree, and et cetera. But then when you then look into the specifics and then you can start, then you come up exactly with the kind of issues that, y that you're mentioning. And an uh, and, uh, uh, I I example, uh, uh, 1325 is uh, an area in which uh, uh, I think it should be possible to uh, move ahead. We're trying to also to implement it by, in Ukraine, uh, we, we try to uh, uh, put women in leading positions in, uh, uh, in the mission, even though I have to say we struggle because often it's the countries that are unable to give us the candidates for us to be able then to pick them and put them in, in leading positions in the mission. So, but that's a, that's a separate issue. But still, even with that, uh, w while everybody agrees in principle to the, the, key, uh, uh, the, the key notions of this, uh, then you try to have a, a focused discussion, how can we operationalize that, and then you find blockages. And, uh, and, and so this is, this is one of the frustrating uh, elements that, that we find, that, that as we flush out the agenda and, and try to transform declaratory policies into action, in a way, then, then we block, we, we get blocked all over whatever. And, uh, and, uh, and also some of, the, uh, um, uh, some of the narratives also, uh, in, in, in the way we, we, had, we recently celebrated the, the, um, uh, uh, the Day of the Women uh, um, uh, on, the, on the 8th of March. And, uh, and it, tell, it had a feeling uh, in, in the Hofburg that it was somehow one constituency uh, proposing this to everybody else, in a way. And, uh, uh, and I think these are, uh, these are instances in which we need to uh, find a more consensual way of, uh, of going ahead, recognizing differences, recognizing, you know, uh, everybody's uh, culture, tradition, etc but then uh, not turning this into an obstacle or into a problem uh, to, to developing uh, common and to further developing uh, uh, common principles and, 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 uh, and common norms in a way, not presenting it into a, you know, something that is important to some. Well, we have to conclude this uh, session, but of course that last comment about women inspires me, and I'm looking at the back of Milan Verveer whom you will hear from later, but to remind us all, women are more than 50% of the talent pool, and this is the 20th anniversary of the Beijing Conference, 
on women, which I attended as part of a small congressional delegation which included one man, three women and one man, and I was there, and it was a really seminal moment, and certainly a hope would be that the OSCE, which is full of competent women, and Ukraine, which is full of competent women, and the world, which is full of competent women, uh, uh, and the Wilson Center, which is led by a woman and full of competent women, uh, would find a way to uh, make this not a one-off and not a, a special conversation, but just to make it what the OSCE does represent, which is an inclusive platform for dialogue and joint action. So with that, uh, Lamberto, you uh, have uh, really uh, not, not just shown up with a lot of talented folks, but contributed to a program that I think will add a lot of value to the conversation in Washington, and we'll show those people a mile from here that there really can be dialogue and an agreement on an action plan, even when there is very, very strong disagreement. Uh, thank you. The next panel will begin at uh, 2 o'clock. Guess what? It's 2 o'clock. Thank you. There we go.